This is going to be an example of calculating a rate law from experimental data. Again, whenever we calculate a rate law, we have to do it experimentally, and we have to have at least three experiments. We are in control of the initial concentrations. In this case, just to make the numbers easy, this is 0.1 molar A, 0.1 molar B. And somehow we're able to measure the rate, and we write that down. Then we keep A the same, and we vary the concentration of B. And again, we measure the rate. Then we keep B the same, and we double the concentration of A, and we see what that does to the rate. So this has to be determined from an instrument, and the, the rate is always delta concentration, delta T. So the rate is going to have units of molarity per second. And I'm going to run through this one quickly just by seeing that we double A, and we see what happens to the rate. And then we double B, and we see what happens to the rate. In this particular case, the rate law, which must be determined, be determined experimentally, is going to end up being second order. That's one of our special cases of the rate law. So we're going to see that we end up at, with the rate law is uh, K times A squared and there is going to be no B term. And second order means that we can do some algebra and find a concentration at any time t and vice versa. So if we run through this quickly, we'll see what the m exponent is, which means we have to look at when does a vary. So a uh, has to vary in order to calculate its power. So if I look at this, A varies from one experiment 1 and 3 and experiment 2 and 3. But we have to see when A varies and B is constant. So we have to be careful when we're comparing experiments. B stays constant in experiment 1 and 3, and A doubles. So A doubles. That means 2 to the m equals, now I compare these rates, 16 over 4, whether, and those are going to cancel anyway, is equal to 4. So 2 to the m equals 4, so I can tell that m equals 2. My exponent on A has to be 2. Now, I've got that figured out, so now I need to determine what the exponent on B equals. So now B has to vary, and A has to remain constant. So we have to choose, are we going to use experiment 1 and 2, or 3 and 2? If we look over at A, A stays the same between experiment 1 and 2. So I'm going to look at B, and B doubles, so going from point 0.1 to point 0.2, B doubles. That word doubling again means I'm going to put a 2. Now I'm looking for the power on B, reactant B, so that's N. Now I'm going to see what happens to the rate. When I double B and keep A the same, the rate does not change. So we get the number 1. So n here equals 0. So that means b does not affect, doesn't affect the rate. This is not common, but it can occur. So this means the rate law equals k a squared and b to the 0 just means it does not depend on b. So this is exactly one of the most simplest cases we could have. Now I need to solve for k. 
<clears throat> which is the rate constant, using uh, either experiment 1, 2, or 3. And so I'm not going to take the time to do that. What I'm trying to show us is the difference between any rate law that we calculate using multiple experiments, and then if by chance <clears throat> the rate law happens to be second order in one reactant only. So the rate law, oops, I messed up here. The rate law says that the rate equals Ka squared. So the rate law is the entire equation. Rate equals K, reactants raised to some power. So the rate is the change in concentration over the change in time. This equals K times the concentration of A squared. Your book does the calculus derivation, which I'm not going to do here. But for second order, we take this equation and do calculus, and we get the equation 1 over the concentration of A after T seconds is equal to positive KT plus 1 over the concentration at time 0. So this is an instantaneous second order instantaneous second order equation. And this is valuable because we can find out at any time t how much of a reactant would be left over. Now if we're doing something in the lab that may not be as important as if we were trying to determine how much pharmaceutical uh, drugs would be in someone's uh, blood after a certain amount of time. This <clears throat> is the initial concentration of A, so we're the ones that have control over that because we make it up in the lab. This is still the rate constant. T is the time that has elapsed. T times zero gives us the initial concentration. Our time might be in seconds or minutes. And then this is the concentration after a certain time T. And I'll just use seconds as our common time unit. So a second order rate law will always have one variable to the second power. Then this equation turns into this equation, which you have to be able to do calculus to believe it or to derive it for yourself. Then the half-life is 1 over k a to the second power. This is when half of the initial concentration is gone or left. And you probably could derive that from here. So when a over t divided by a naught equals 0.5, then uh, that means your final concentration is divided by your initial concentration is exactly half. So if you substitute this in terms, let a to the 0 equal a t over 0.5, which turns into 2 times a of t, if we get substitute one variable in terms of the other and plug all of that into here and solve for t, then we can take this equation and derive this equation. We don't need to know that, but we do need to know what a second order reactions rate law looks like. 
sorry, this camera keeps moving around. And when it is second order, which instantaneous equation we would use to solve for t or this or this or this. There's four unknowns here, but we have to know three of them in order to solve the equation. The problem might give us the half-life, and then we would use the half-life to solve for k. And then we might be looking for a final concentration. So again, a second order rate law could be determined from this type of data. Any, any rate law is possible. M can be anything, and N could be anything. But if we have the special condition of the second reactant has no effect on the rate, and the first reactant is raised to the second power or the first power, then we have the two simplest cases.